So objectives of today's talk are to try to distinguish between primary and secondary headaches, identify various subtypes of the headaches, review migraine headaches, what are those, what are the symptoms, how we treat migraine headaches, and also discuss what we call secondary headaches, so headaches that usually are a little bit of more concern and need more testing than migraine headaches. So regarding uh, headaches, we first divide them in two big subgroups, primary and secondary headaches. Can you your mic? Oh. Right. So primary headaches are the ones that uh, are headache disorder by its own, and they are not caused by any other conditions or any other disorders. Secondary headaches are usually headaches that are caused by some other medical condition, and usually these come out in very close relation uh, time-wise with the medical condition that's causing secondary headache. So with primary headaches, the most common primary headache is tension-type headache, up to 90% of population. So most of the people who are sitting in this room at some point in their lifetime have had ten tension-type headache. Most common headache that is seen in any doctor's office, both primary care and certainly neurology, are migraine headaches. Although it's only 12% of population, again, these are headaches that are more severe, more disabling, and patients tend to, and people tend to seek more help with these headaches. Then we have what's called trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias, and there are a couple subtypes, cluster headaches, hemicrania-type headaches. These are not very common headaches. These are actually very rare headaches, and not <coughs> even all the physicians know about these, but if we can distinguish these headaches, we can certainly help because treatment is a little bit different. And then there are primary stabbing or so-called ice pick headaches, primary cough, exertion exercise headaches, um, and some other less common subtypes. So tension type headache, again, the most common primary headache disorder, usually affects whole head, both sides, mild to moderate pain, steady, pressing, band-like, squeezing. Some people say it feels like I have a tight cap on my head. Usually people don't have much of the sensitivity to light sound. They don't feel nauseated. Occasionally they might have maybe slight light sensitivity, but only that or very slight sound sensitivity. And again, most of the time people still can go on with their daily activities when they have tension type headache. Cluster type headaches, again, not a common headache, but quite severe and disabling. Tends to affect men more than women, about four times more frequently men than women. They always affect just one side of the head around the eye, temporal area. Very, very intense, unbearable, have been called in the past suicide headaches associated with the droopy eyelid on the si uh, same side of the headache, tearing from the eye, redness of the eye, runny, stuffy nose on the side of the headache, and restlessness. So for those of you who have migraine headaches, you know that usually when you have migraine headache, you, if possible, tend to go to the quiet, dark room, lie down, not to move, not to think. People who have cluster type headaches, they cannot stay still most of the time. They are the ones who are pacing around, they are hitting their head on the wall. Um, and these are much shorter than migraine headaches, lasting only 15 minutes to three hours, but again, very, very disabling. And people can have multiple episodes throughout the day of these headaches. Hemicranius, we divide paroxysmal and continuous. So paroxysmal hemicranius, pain-wise, somewhat similar to cluster, but tend to be briefer, so only two minutes to 30 minutes, but more frequent episodes. Patients with cluster type headaches have maybe five to eight episodes per day. These can have, uh, patients with paroxysmal hemicrania can have up to 20 or more episodes per day. Uh, more common in women than in men, and these headaches tend to respond to indomethacin specifically. So this is one of the rare medical conditions where response to the treatment is actually in diagnostic criteria. Hemicrania continue again, tends to affect one side of the head, not as severe as cluster or migraine, continuous pain on the same side, maybe slight droopiness of the eyelid or stuffy nose on that side can have some fluctuations, peaks uh, in the intensity of the pain, 
and again, responds to indomethacin. Migraine headaches, so the most common headaches that we see in the office, again, tends to affect females more than men. One in four women tends to have migraine headaches. So again, we can do the math here in the audience. Um, can affect either one side or both, usually moderate to severe pain, throbbing, pounding, pulsating, tends to get worse with any regular activity. So people say, even if I just get up and walk, go up and down the stairs, try to do my daily activities, actually makes my headache worse. Um, these people are sensitive to light, sensitive to sounds, sometimes even sensitive to smells. Um, they can have nausea, vomiting, and these headaches tend to last for four hours or longer if untreated. Causes of migraines, uh, there is a big genetic component. We know that up to 90% of the people who have migraine headaches have some relative in their family with migraine headaches. If one of the parents has migraine headache, child has at least 40% chance of having migraine headache. If both parents have migraine headaches, child is doomed, 75% chance of having migraine headache. There are some migraine subtypes, specifically hemiplegic migraine, that is known to be caused by specific genes, but all the other sort of garden variety migraines, there are many multiple genes, and the thought is that it's not the one gene that causes this predisposition, but it's a combination of multiple genes and environmental um, things that can uh, predispose and actually cause migraine headache. So migraine is a disorder of the brain. People who have migraine headache have very sensitive, hyper excitable brain to begin with. And there are nerve cells in the brain stem that contain large amount of chemical called serotonin that is implicated in regulation of the pain. There are multiple triggers that can cause migraine headaches and up to 75% of people who have migraines can identify some of the triggers, although there are 25 that will not have any known triggers or at least identifiable triggers. So fatigue, lack of sleep, too much sleep, napping during the day, skipping meals, stress, weather changes, menses, certain foods, MSG and artificial sweeteners can trigger migraines. So again, the most common, we don't have a pointer, but the most common is stress followed by hormones. So again, women tend to have more migraine headaches around their menstruation, usually one to two days before the period and then maybe throughout. Skipping meals followed by weather changes, sleep disturbances, and then all the other things. So, Migraine is not just a headache. There are multiple phases actually in migraine attack, starting with premonitory phase that can start hours to days even before the headache pain. During this phase, people tend to have increased yawning, increased urination, maybe mood changes, appetite changes, some cravings. They can have some neck pain or stiffness. Um, they can have some light sensitivity and sound sensitivity even before the headache starts. In some people, this phase can be followed by auras that can be either visual, where they can lose vision or part of the vision, see any spots, dots, shimmers, wiggly lines. They can have what's called sensory aura, where they can have some numbness, tingling, or even speech problems. And then this is followed by the headache phase when one actually has the pain followed by postdrome, and during the postdrome, again, there could be increased fatigue, um, mood changes, and also increased sensitivity of the skin, so-called allodynia. So with prodrome, again, this can precede headache pain hours or even days before. There are multiple anatomic structures that are implicated um, in the prodrome syndrome, hypothalamus. So I don't have a pointer up there. Uh, so is responsible for fatigue, depression, irritability, food cravings, and yawning. And sometimes it's hard to distinguish, is the food the trigger, or was that just a craving that actually preceded headache and is a symptom of the headache? Brainstem is implicated in causing tenderness and stiffness of the neck. 
uh, cortex, so co covering of the brain, is responsible for light, sound, and smell sensitivity. And the limbic system, that's combination of hypothalamus, thalamus, hippocampus, amygdala, <coughs> again, uh, contributes to depression and sort of lack of interest. Both hypothalamic and brainstem neurons regulate response to the changes to different stimuli from both outside and inside the body. And again, because there's this hyperexcitability, even slight stimuli can actually cause migraine headaches. So again, brief overview about migraine pathophysiology. So again, the brain is very excitable to begin with. Multifactorial, genetic predisposition, hormonal fluctuations that result in lower threshold to response to variety of triggers. That can trigger what's called cortical spreading depression. So there's a massive depolarization in the brain cells that releases excitatory amino acids, glutamate, and MDA, usually starting at the back of the head, uh, moving slowly about two to five millimeters per minute. And this cortical spreading depression is responsible for aura symptoms. So again, if any of you have migraines with aura, you know that usually you have maybe little spot that gradually starts getting bigger or you have numbness in the hand or around the mouth that gradually starts spreading over the rest of the body. Sometimes this cortical spreading depression can be triggered by decreased magnesium levels and depletion of the magnesium. That's why sometimes we do use magnesium to treat migraine headaches. That is followed by activation of the brainstem and trigeminovascular system in the brainstem that releases pro-inflammatory neuropeptides, substance P and calcitonin gene-related peptides, CGRP, that my colleague will discuss a little bit more in detail. And then these neuropeptides, again, increase central sensitization and neurogenic inflammation, vasodilatation in the covering of the brain that causes the pain. So headache phase itself, again, is due to this central sensitization and increased response uh, to the lowered threshold of the responses. And even small benign stimuli from the outside sometimes can trigger face and head pain. <clears throat> 